and welcome to Mystic Dog Mama, the podcast for soul-led dog mamas, where you'll discover how to best nourish your dog and yourself, mind, body, and soul. I'm your host, Dr. Alexia Meller. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm so excited to have you here with me today. I don't know if you can sense the squeals of delight I have about introducing you to today's guest, Dr. Laura Donaldson, but I just know you're going to do a lot of head nodding and have some real aha moments because Laura is an absolute treasure. If you have experienced challenges with your dog's behavior and traditional operant approaches haven't really helped, then this conversation is for you. It's also for you if you're interested in understanding your dog's behavior from a more emotional perspective that takes into account how emotions are stored in the body. And it's also for you if you want to learn how to be a better advocate for your dog. I mean, basically anyone who likes dogs, works with dogs, or lives with dogs needs to listen to what Laura has to say. So go ahead and forward this episode on to anyone you think would benefit, because honestly, when more people are able to have compassion for dogs and their trauma and their own traumas, I'm convinced that the world will become a more loving place. Dr. Laura Donaldson is a former university professor turned certified dog trainer, certified dog behavior consultant, and Karen Pryor Certified Training Partner, whose work really focuses on, in my opinion, creating a paradigm shift around how we frame and approach quote-unquote undesirable behaviors in our dogs like reactivity and aggression. Laura has dedicated herself to improving the well-being of dogs by getting rid of the notion of the well-behaved dog and instead focusing on how to support dogs in experiencing deep safety and emotional resilience so that they can navigate anything they encounter in the world. In this conversation, Laura and I talk about how asking our dogs the question, What do I need to learn from you to help you feel safe in this context can be truly life-changing, both for your dog and for you. We talk about how understanding the impact of trauma on our dogs and the links between trauma and aggression can help us to understand and have compassion for our own traumas. We also discuss some techniques that you can use with your own dog to help them release and ground the charge they feel in their bodies from trauma, including Laura's grounding work and other processes like emotional freedom technique, or EFT, and energy work. I told Laura that I am crowning her the queen of webinars because she has created so many incredibly rich and informative webinars and trainings that you can access on her website. It was through Laura's free webinar on grounding that I first heard her speak in depth about these somatic approaches to trauma and problematic behaviors, and I cannot recommend her trainings enough. Her work has been so helpful for me as I navigate a lot of Lucky's behaviors that many would label as reactive or aggressive, and that I know are a result of the traumas he has experienced in his life. Laura is launching a new training this January called Transforming Puppies, which she talks a bit about in this conversation you're about to hear. You can find out more about this training and all of Laura's other trainings on her course platform, which I will share in the show notes, so definitely check that out. Finally, this episode is supported by Aspirationary, which, in full transparency, is another project of mine, where we create books, notebooks, and stationery to help you become all you aspire to be. If you are looking for a safe space to explore shadow work and your own traumas, our moon magic and shadow work journals and workbooks might be a useful support for you. You can take a peek at them on our Aspirationary Instagram account, which is spelled A-S-P-I-R-A-T-I-O-N-E-R-Y. I've also left that link in the show notes. Okay, let's go. Hello, I am so thrilled to welcome today's guest to the Mystic Dog Mama podcast, Dr. Laura Donaldson. Laura, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Alexia. I'm delighted to be here. 
Oh, we're so excited to have you here. I was speaking to you a little bit before we started recording that one of the things that Mystic Dog Mama really focuses on is taking a holistic approach and perspective to how we nourish our dogs, mind, body, and soul. And when I was thinking about the conversations that I wanted to have around training, behavior, that sort of a thing, you immediately came to mind because I found your work just to let everybody know who's listening, I found your work through um, social media outlets that are really focused on taking the perspective of prioritizing the emotional state of the dog and working with a dog from their emotional needs and also from a a somatic perspective, really looking at the, the body of the dog and how they process the world around them. And you offer such a, a gracious, informative, free webinar for people on the concept of grounding that was unbelievably just rich and helpful. And I was so grateful to engage with it for my dog, Lucky. And I wanted to just bring you on to talk more about the work that you're doing in the world. So thank you so much for being here. You are very welcome. And I'm always happy to talk about the emotional well-being of dogs and um, the my work in grounding comes out of my, I'm also a certified trauma professional mm. uh, in addition to being a certified dog behavior consultant. And I'm also a Karen Pryor certified training partner so that kind of covers the whole (laughs) gamut but but most of my work for the last few years has been um inspired by coming to terms with my own childhood trauma and it's very interesting how my work with trauma and dogs has helped me to personally to do that but the grounding particularly is a uh, is very well known in the human trauma studies that take somatic psychology seriously, right? Ariel Schwartz, Pat Ogden, um, the whole Hakomi method, psychotherapy, uh, people who take because is Bessel. Vander Kolk, probably the world's preeminent trauma specialist. He's a psychiatrist in Boston, Massachusetts, here in the U.S. As he famously said in the title of his book, the body keeps the score, right? Trauma and actually most difficult behavior issues for us humans and dogs is held in the body. Yeah. And um, what comes with that is, yes, the body keeps the score, but the body also has innate wisdom uh, known as coping mechanisms that we use to help us um, deal with the deep emotional learnings that are motivating our traumatic response or our fear, stress, anxiety, whether we're a dog or a human. Right. Uh, and so grounding is comes out of that perspective of, okay, um, actually, <laughs> A lot of dogs are trying to do this anyway, and we're not recognizing it. And I think I I uh, gave a couple of examples of that in my webinar of dogs putting their paws up on their human. Mm-hmm. Um or in the case of Annie Phoenix's dog putting his paws in a a cement bucket (laughs) on a cement, you know, it's that because grounding is a way to feel, um, to experience what in trauma studies you might call present centeredness. 
Mm -hmm. to remind yourself, okay, I'm here. I'm safe. This is my body. Right. Um, you know, I'm getting lost in flashbacks or the deep anxiety and stress and fear I'm experiencing, but I'm right now, right here, I'm safe. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's also a dissipating grounding is that dissipation. It like an electrical grounding outlet it allows for that escalating arousal to exit yeah and yeah. find a safe um you know um exit into the ground or whatever your grounding object is yeah so i think that that is a nice segue into what your podcast is all about because if someone saw a video and i have one in that grounding webinar of a dog okay let's say this is a dog out in a parking lot checking out what's who's coming who's going and actually this is a dog with a lot of anxiety issues and then the dog comes put comes and put puts their paws on their human shoulder or or thighs depending on the size of the dog traditional dog training would say you've got a dog who's jumping um can't do that we got to stop that behavior uh it's like you know that's not a checkbox for the well-behaved dog right and that's why I think we need to get rid of this whole notion of the well-behaved dog because we have to understand each individual dog and what this behavior means for them. Mm -hmm. uh, for dogs who use grounding, putting their paws on us as a form of grounding, it's not a nuisance behavior, and I hate that word anyway. Mm -hmm. There are really no nuisance behaviors. There are behaviors we don't understand, and so we label them <laughs> from a very human-centric perspective. But, um, you know, is this putting paws on me, providing the dog with a deep emotional relief? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, there are a couple of things within that that I'd like to kind of circle back to. And and one is how are you defining trauma? Because I think that that's something that um people often I feel and I think it's the same for dogs actually experience traumatic experiences but wouldn't necessarily label it as trauma because the idea for them is it's got to be so extreme in order to um, be labeled as trauma. And again, this goes back to the labeling mm. issue. But in reality, from what I'm understanding from, from your perspective, trauma doesn't have to be some big, horrible, seemingly horrible thing in order for, for the individual to experience that as trauma. So could you talk a little bit more about that? My favorite subject. <laughs> you may be sorry you asked. <laughs> never, never. I love it. <laughs> um. Yeah, and let me just put in a plug, if I can. Absolutely. I created a webinar for um, just people who are living with dogs, not necessarily for professionals, although it's great for professionals too. And I made it almost free. Almost free. It's 10 bucks, which is like a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Absolutely. Uh, and it's called Why Becoming Trauma-Informed Will Change Everything You Do With Dogs. Mm -hmm. And it goes through the question that you just asked in a deep dive way. Because um, in human trauma studies, mm -hmm. uh, at least here in North America and the American Psychological Association 
has had inordinate influence on how trauma is defined globally. Um, that may be changing, but um, the APA, American Psychological Association, uh, took and still takes a very narrow view of trauma. And they were pushed to even recognize PTSD. Wow. Right? And it was only soldiers coming back from Afghanistan when we, you know, the here in the U.S., um, the VA was experiencing a flood of uh, male soldiers uh, experiencing combat PTSD. And this was where PTSD was first recognized in dogs, two military dogs coming back from Afghanistan, wow. right? So the parallels between the dogs and the humans is really uncanny, although it was hard enough for people to recognize PTSD in humans much less in dogs where even 50 years ago, you still heard people saying dogs do not experience emotions. Um, so the problem with the A American Psychological Association approach and the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual, which is how all clinical providers define their what they're doing with clients is that it even had a very narrow definition of PTSD. Wow. Um, so there's been a whole movement through people like Bessel van der Kolk and Ariel Schwartz and a, a whole group of clinical psychiatrists, psychologists um, who resisted mm. <laughs> that and said, look, uh, you know, PTSD is much bigger than this. Uh, and there is a thing called complex PTSD, which is often, uh, and you often experience what I call macro trauma, and micro trauma together mm -hmm. like you you have trauma stacking just like you have trigger stacking right, right. so you can have a dog for example like a person can have a very devastating experience let's say they're attacked outside by another dog mm -hmm. and you see the difference and immediately they start barking and lunging at other dogs that is a form of PTSD mm. um, especially if it goes on and it doesn't resolve in a week mm -hmm. right uh, because some dogs could experience that attack and they're and then after a day or two of decompressing they're fine uh, other dogs it changes their whole life Right. And they become afraid to go outside or they're in perpetual fight mode or flight mode. Or if it's bad enough, they go into behavioral shutdown. Mm -hmm. um, and I I think what is way under recognized are two things. One is the link between trauma and aggressive behavior in dogs. Because we know in humans that is a big response to trauma, that mm -hmm. perpetual fight mode. Yep. It's called an adaptive survival strategy. And that's how I have reframed it for dogs, right? Your dog isn't being naughty. Your dog isn't trying to drive you crazy. <laughs> Your dog is not, you know, morally corrupt or I don't know, whatever. There's a lot of narratives. Yeah. Difficult, unlovable, untrainable, 
just like with kids, right? right? If you don't recognize trauma in kids, you call them, you're just being so difficult. Right. You're unlovable. Why are you doing this? Same with dogs, because we don't recognize that this is coming deep within the body as a survival strategy. It We may not like it and we don't want to, you know, I'm not saying you need to live with it forever, but right. I think at least we've got to recognize this is not just a naughty Right, right. Or nuisance uh, or bad to use the kind of moral framework behavior. Right. Well, something that's coming up for me um, in what you're saying as well in terms of redefining reactivity, because I know that that's a, a topic that um, is is often under debate around what does mm. reactivity actually mean? And is that actually an appropriate, again, a label? and I was talking to a friend of mine and mentioned that I was going to be speaking to you. And I asked if she had a question and she, one of the questions that she asked is, first of all, why do you think that the link between reactivity and trauma within dog training for the most part is overlooked and not addressed? So how do we go about shifting that? But, but also, is it helpful when, when we look at things, for example, um, most of the great spiritual teachings on some level are talking about it in terms of practicing the teaching that one of the things that's really helpful is to in, in kind of modern terms shift from reacting to responding mm -hmm. so th so that we are able to witness and take almost take a, a moment take a breath in between the, recognizing the response that's coming up or the feelings that are coming up in the body and not act from that place, but create a bit of space and, and instead respond. And I wonder if that sort of way of thinking about reactivity with dogs is appropriate, as well as how do we perhaps use that as a, as a kind of gateway, as, as a way of framing for people to help to help them understand how to deal with the trauma that underlies quote unquote reactive behavior? <clears throat> well, I I think I love the question about how do we change this? So let's get back to that one after um, I try to work my way through <laughs> this one. And I, so I'll just say, I hate that word reactive it is a cognitive distortion. Mm -hmm. uh, I would call it a label. And a label is almost always a cognitive distortion. Why? Because it's just a huge generalization that lumps <laughs> an incredible... Um, variety of behaviors contacts into one uh noun it's not even a verb it's a <laughs> you know it's a noun um so i i i try to avoid using it at all costs because what you are actually looking at is a dog let's just say Let's take the example of a dog who barks and lunges at every dog they meet when they're out on a conventional leash walk on a six foot leash or God forbid, a retractable leash. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that barking and lunging, you know, what do we learn? How informative is calling that behavior reactive zero it, it's not it's not informative at all a much better question to ask would be actually quite two questions to ask is first what relief are you seeking with this behavior why are you doing it and in most dogs 
that barking and lunging functions as a giant stop signal. Stop. Don't come any closer. I think you're dangerous. You know, don't do yeah. not approach. Don't make me do what I don't want to do. Um, and it comes from a dog who is experiencing what I call a neuroception of danger. And that has, they call it um, amygdala hijack, right? right? Our autonomic sympathetic system has hijacked our um, ability to think before we act, to actually have control over our physical responses. And one reason is when you feel in perpetual danger, like these dogs that we all have seen who are barking and lunging at everything mm -hmm. they see, um, you can hear the audible click of the left brain hemisphere, the prefrontal cortex, all our thinking, all the brain clusters involved in thinking, click off. They are deactivated. And we now have the pictures to prove that. Right. Uh, if you read, and I highly recommend, Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score, he shows functional magnetic resonance imaging of a person just like you and me um, experiencing a flashback. Mm. And guess what? The right side, the arousal, the, you know, that is our arousal system, the amygdala, the hippocampus um, is lit up like a amusement part along with the visual cortex. Because mm -hmm. if you're having a flashback, you are seeing what is right in front of you and the left brain hemisphere dark mm -hmm. dark nothing it's not even that it's faintly <laughs> it's like lights dark. out <laughs> yes lights out and i think that is happening in way too many dogs mm -hmm. Right. Because they are. So I don't call that barking and lunging behavior reactive because that gets us nowhere. Mm -hmm. I do call it hyper vigilant. Mm -hmm. I call it hyper aroused, hyper responsive. But even more accurately, those are adaptive survival strategies because that dog has deep emotional learnings that this world is a dangerous place. Mm -hmm. And um, that, and that, you know, they are doing the best they can mm -hmm. to keep themselves safe. That does not make life easy for us. Correct. <laughs> right. Yes. I'm not uh, saying that, but I think at least, we need to try and have a compassionate and informed understanding of what's happening. And it's not just a dismissive, my dog is reactive, this is a nuisance. Mm -hmm. You know, at worst, I'm going to get a shock collar and suppress that behavior, or even thinking that we will be able to address this with just your usual operant commands, right. leave it, right. be quiet, keep walking. Well, yeah, that also suppresses behavior, but it never addresses those deep emotional learnings that are motivating the behavior in the first place. Right. Well, I, I can speak firsthand to this uh, with, I was mentioning before we started recording that Lucky is he falls under the category of a pandemic pup and he was in his kind of peak window for socialization as a puppy when we went into full lockdown. And so when we came back out of lockdown, he was afraid of everything and he's also mm -hmm. been attacked by dogs. So you add, like you were talking about that kind of stacking, it's been yeah. one thing after the other. And I have personally found when I was, 
you know, doing the whole YouTube search for how to deal with reactive dogs. And it is mostly operant perspectives. Mm -hmm. He is not listening to me when I say leave it. Even mm -hmm. the, he will be barking his, his head off at a dog. Usually it's an off leash dog, a larger off leash dog. Cause that's what attacked him in the first place. So now it's been transferred and generalized to any large mm -hmm. off leash dog is a threat. It can be a hundred feet away. And he is like you said, hyper vigilant. And then the barking starts. And if I ask him to leave it, he's, he's not even hearing me. The, mm -hmm. the words are not entering his huge Chihuahua ears. Like that is just, <laughs> it's not happening. And I, I think you're right that the, what what I've noticed for myself is that I need to change my perspective on the expectations that I have for him in that moment, as well as the expectations of everyone around me who's pointing, telling me I need to control my dog. You know, there's all that judgment that comes onto us as mm -hmm. well as, as the pet parent of a reactive quote unquote dog. Uh, and taking that perspective of, okay, so how do I address this emotionally? Looking at that, I probably can't do it in that moment. In that moment, it's get him out of the situation as quickly as possible. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But that taking an overall perspective of how do I work with him so that he is more emotionally resilient in those kinds of scenarios. And I, I wondered if you could touch on maybe some things that people could actually do um, with dogs that are presenting like that. Well, first is stop taking your dog on a conventional leash walk on a six yeah. foot right. leash, because we know that that often makes things worse for dogs. It takes away all their escape routes. They're subjected to forced interactions. And at least here in the U.S., most of our towns, cities and villages are laid out on a grid pattern. Mm -hmm. So whatever you're seeing, another dog is approaching you head on. The most confrontational, scary view mm -hmm. possible. Mm -hmm. Or they're coming around a right angle corner and startling you. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's much better for dogs. A loopy, loopy, loopy walking in a big, wide open space, uh, space, I would be doing decompression walks on a long line and no, no over what, no exposure to triggers. If you see trouble coming, you just turn around, get in the car or go home. Mm -hmm. um, but even more, this is where the question about how we need to transform mm -hmm. um, our work with dogs. And this is not just for professionals. This is for those of us who, who are just living with dogs, right? And so I come out of 10 years, and this is how my quote unquote second career, because my first career was as a Cornell university professor mm -hmm. um i retired and for the last 15 years i've been doing behavior consulting full-time i was doing it before but in a part-time way so i i really i lived for 10 years with two female dogs a shepherd collie mix and a female border working border collie that wanted to kill each other. Oh, wow. And I have worked with thousands of dogs who have been deemed dangerous by the courts, dogs with bite histories, dogs who, um, you know, most people wouldn't want to be very near, but the only significant bites I have ever gotten were from my own dogs. Wow from these two females years and years ago. Uh, one was trying to break up a fight. <laughs> and the second time, um, uh, it, it's too long a story, but in both cases, especially the second one, I got bitten down to the bone 
uh, oh my on my thigh by my female border collie. And I had to go to the ER and I got 12 stitches. And then I decided, okay, I need to learn something right. if we're all going to survive this. Right. And, and because I had been doing desensitization, counter conditioning, which was not helping. I mean, it would have just a limited effect and then it would disappear because this kind of behavior is coming from a place um, that is much deeper than I think most of those. I mean, that's uh, the the issues with desensitization, I think, are a whole nother discussion yeah. but uh i quickly learned i was gonna have to think outside the box and that's when i started my slow thinking is life-saving for dogs program i started emphasizing social giving dogs the time and space to do social processing in their own way <clears throat> Before we began pressuring them to engage with other people, other dogs, mm -hmm. other contacts. Um, and and so I quickly learned I needed to start having conversations with my dogs, right? Because mm -hmm. my model of the dog-human relationship <clears throat> is a partnership. Right. It's not a monologue. <laughs> like I talk, you listen, because that was not working and it won't work for these, won't work for trauma, won't work for aggressive behavior because behavior suppression is not what I want. I care too much about the emotional well being. I want my dogs to feel good imagine and, have, <laughs> and feel safe deep yeah. safety not just you know wearing a muzzle right. i want them inside to feel like okay i'm deeply safe um and so the first question i ask any dog my own or a client dog is not here's my laundry list Mm -hmm. Let's see how you can check off the boxes. No nuisance behaviors, no barking, no counter surfing, no putting your paws up on my shoulder. And one, I guess, symptom of this approach is if you look at some of the popular dog journals, mm -hmm who publish online and you might get their emails, the vast majority of their articles and posts are about how to stop behavior, mm -hmm. how to stop blank and just fill in the blank. <laughs> uh, good luck with that. <laughs> You know, it never worked with me as a child. Does right. it ever work? You know, right. you may wishful thinking. I, I just want to stop all this. Much better approach is to start having conversations, interspecies, cooperative conversations. And the first question I'm asking my canine partner is what do I need to learn from you to help you feel safe in this context? And I need to be willing to change what I'm doing. Like, okay, we're not going to go on conventional walks on a six-foot leash. We're going to do decompression walks for the next year. Um, you know, I'm not going to force you to um engage with visitors right now because you don't you really don't have the coping mechanisms to be able to handle that and feel good about it 
And if I keep forcing you, oh yeah, the answer to your fear and anxiety is just to try and introduce you to more people. Right. <laughs> no, that doesn't yeah. work for us. And right. it certainly does not work for our dogs. Right. I think within that too, is the call for us as pet parents to be advocates for our yes. dogs. Yeah. Because, you know, I run into that a, a lot when I'm out walking and I use, I, I'm always made fun of on the walks because I, I religiously use a 30 foot long line mm -hmm. everywhere we go. He does not, I don't own mm -hmm. a short leash. I'm not interested in that. And, and when people approach me and they ask me like, why on earth, especially since he's a, a chihuahua. So the joke is why such a big leash for such a small dog? <laughs> and I'll, I'll start to talk a little bit about this, but then I'll say, you know, he's uncomfortable with people he doesn't know. And what's the first thing that the person does? They reach down with their hand in his face. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, if he's exposed to me, then he's going to like me. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's, that is not at all the case. You're reinforcing why he doesn't like this kind of scenario. And I've had the comment made to me that I'm going to have problems in my life, my life, because my life experience, because my dog doesn't like to be around other people. And, you know, my question for that is why do we have this sort of box that we think that every dog should fit into in, that we've constructed? Mm -hmm. We've made this idea that they should have to, they should like this and I'm perfect, you know, in my own case, I'm perfectly okay with, he, he's probably never going to be a social butterfly and mm -hmm. that's okay. So it's my job to advocate for him and not put him in positions where he's just going to be upset. I'm not a social butterfly and I wouldn't want somebody to like force me into group, large group <laughs> encounters all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I do think that that is really critical recognizing that just like us humans, Dogs are on a continuum. Some dogs are very extroverted. Mm -hmm. They're very social and they genuinely love other dogs and being in a lot, you know, with a lot of dogs. Most dogs are somewhere in the middle because at the other end of the continuum are, um, well, they would be dogs who view other dogs as dangerous and that is a whole but but also there just are dogs who uh, may have one or two dog friends mm -hmm. that's fine mm -hmm. you know that's fine and then the vast majority are somewhere in between but that's where we need to actually be having those conversations with the dog in front of us okay what works for you? What do I need to do to help you feel safe? It's not taking you to the dog park and turning you loose because you need to be socialized to other dogs. Right. And it is exactly what you say, being an advocate, especially with a dog like a Chihuahua, right? Because everyone just thinks they're adorable. Oh, I just want to pet him and pick him up and uh very difficult for small dogs mm. but especially small dogs who think the world is kind of scary anyway mm -hmm. um and you know my my view is if people don't like it that's their problem Absolutely. I'm not going to spend one iota of my energy worrying about that. And I live in a place where um, a lot of people just feel free to give you advice all the time <laughs> about your dog. And it's mm -hmm. routinely bad. Mm -hmm. uh, so I I have learned the art of just... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you for your input. Click off. That's right. <laughs> That's very much the approach I take too. Yeah. Or physically putting myself in between. Yeah. That person and my dog, because, all, you know, that person is saying all dogs love me. Um, here, let me do scary things. Mm -hmm. 
and get bitten. Exactly. Exactly. Or, and then blame the dog. Yes. Yeah. Or you. Or yeah, that too. Or both of you. Or both yeah. of us. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I wondered if you could touch on a little bit as well in terms of some of the practical things that you have found effective for helping dogs to release that charge. You've mentioned grounding, and I wondered if mm-hmm. you could describe that a little bit for people who aren't familiar with that, of how you would, you, you've talked about how a dog will self-select, for example, putting their paws up on their owner, but how do you teach a dog um, those sorts of options as, as choices for themselves? And, and I believe you are, you're also working with the EFT method, method or tapping. Yes, I I do a lot of emotional freedom techniques, um, and I just created a free ebook on the triple heater smoothie. Oh, amazing! A, a fabulous. Uh, it's been known in human mm-hmm. um, circles, but I've adapted it for dogs. Amazing. And it really is very a very powerful, calming, um, flushing because the triple heater meridian is in charge of the body's arousal system. Mm-hmm. Right. So because of the dogs I work with, traumatized dogs and dogs struggling with aggressive behavior that is the most important behavior meridian but it turns out it's also really helpful for us humans absolutely because the triple heater meridian starts right here at the side right in the you come off your eyebrow and then it goes back behind the ear down and humans it goes to the collarbone right here um and so what you would do is you would trace that part of the triple heater meridian backwards to as a flushing technique don't massage it's just a gentle going backwards and then uh when you get to the collarbone i just do kind of a dissipating Mm -hmm gesture Mm -hmm. and you can do the same thing with dogs and so are you actually physically touching the dog when you're doing that or are you hovering above me physically touching them with a bit of pressure yes gentle gentle and so if you have a dog who doesn't like to be handled around his head you may not be able to do it or you may have to start at the ear right and go but but just keep at it i do so let me just say and i also have a webinar that people can enroll in it's on demand called emotional um clinical tapping emotional freedom techniques for you and your dog and i'm actually developing a new one right now called emotional first aid for you and your dog. Oh my goodness. That is With so needed. Triple heater, smoothie. I do some humming. That is for us humans, not your dog. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but touch and breathe. Because uh, I don't directly tap on dogs. Okay. They, most dogs do not like the percussive, even though it's gentle. So I do surrogate tapping. Okay. And with that, is that done on you or is that done on the guardian? No, that, well, that is the guardian can do it. Whoever is, has the relationship with the dog. um, Because we know that energy travels. Yeah. So I, I don't necessarily have to actually be doing it Mm hands-on. And it helps me clear my own issues. Mm -hmm which goes a long way to helping my dog. Absolutely. Because we can definitely experience vicarious trauma from our dog's behavior. Mm -hmm. Let's say your dog has been attacked. Well, that's you too. Yeah. Maybe you were knocked over and just the sheer stress 
in shock of that, uh, but also living long term mm -hmm. with a dog who has issues. So I think this is as much for us as it is for our dogs. So yes, I use a lot of emotional evidence-based mm -hmm. emotional freedom techniques um and things like grounding which is a an emotional freedom it's probably more energy psychology mm -hmm. um technique but but i also have developed it's what i'm now calling nonviolent social processing ooh what is this well I'm giving a whole webinar on it. <laughs> Laura, you are, the, you are the queen of webinars, I have to say. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not going anywhere, so I might as well do something with time, right? I love uh, it. But uh, this, this has come out of one of the ways that um, what is usually called dog training needs to change. Mm -hmm. Right. And one of the ways it needs to change is we need to separate out dogs doing social processing, taking in information from the environment, interpreting that, and then using that information to make decisions about their behavior mm -hmm. from the often relentless pressure that we put on them to engage right with people dogs other situations um environmental distractions whatever um without ever asking can you actually process this or is it going to be an experience and overwhelm and uh, maybe even behavioral shutdown Mm -hmm. So I, in the last year or so, have built, because I did a lot on social processing, but partly because of the uh, controversies <laughs> over the resurgence of aversive punishment oriented and people saying oh using the shock collar is not so bad and now of course they don't call it that they use a lot of euphemisms mm -hmm. e-collar stem collar vibration collar mm -hmm. it's still a shock collar mm -hmm. um, and i wanted to go much further to me, it's not enough to just say, I don't use aversives. What we who use more positive methods need to do is actually articulate an ethic of nonviolence mm. and how that um, impacts our daily lives and everything we do with dogs. So one way that would impact it is it would totally change how we view things like aggressive and reactive behavior mm -hmm. right because i have a whole part of nonviolent social processing is an ethic of befriending befriending our dogs adaptive survival strategies mm -hmm. which yeah. means you have a dog who's barking and lunging at everything <laughs> or you have a dog who doesn't even want to go out of the house i work with dogs the main issue was they don't want to go out of the house of course that's just the tip of the iceberg because why don't they want to go out life is just too dangerous i'm too scared i'm panicked i can't even leave this space mm -hmm. um so befriending that adaptive survival strategy because a dog that doesn't want to go out of the house is trying to survive right 
right? Not being stubborn, not being naughty, not blowing me off, not ruining my day because damn it, now I can't go for a walk. (laughs) (laughs) None of the above. And I've heard all of them. Um, No, I, I think, you know, we befriend the adaptive survival strategy, which does not mean we want to live with it in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. It means you have to recognize the value that this strategy is providing the dog with some deep relief and a deep need for safety and survival. One way we can frame that with the humans is actually, it's asking us to do shadow work with our dog Mm -hmm. and with shadow work where it's not about that resistance of the thing that's coming up, the resistance of the trigger. But like you're saying, asking both ourselves as we're asking our dog, what is this teaching us? What is this behavior that my dog is presenting, teaching me about how he or she is actually feeling? And then it becomes an opportunity to both reframe and to take different actions rather than just blaming the dog, like you're saying, or, or, or assigning them a label that's just not helpful whatsoever. Exactly. So, um, you know, with the dog that I'm thinking of, who didn't want to go out of the house, and this was a dog who lived in downtown Manhattan. Oh, God. <laughs> or the this was the apartment condo building. Yeah. Uh, and they live five blocks from Central park um a we you know first you you cannot force the dog to go out and that was the previous approach Mm. or pressure the dog through using food Mm -hmm. luring come out and here get this beautiful piece of steak and then the dog comes out eats the food and then oh i'm outside help right right (laughs) No, you have to recognize the dog is feeling deeply unsafe and everything we do has to take that into, uh, use that as an organizing principle, right? So we worked a lot on things like grounding, Mm -hmm. helping the dog feel safe. Um, So what did that look like in that instance? Well, there a couple of things. And then, uh, so you could help the dog ground all the way down the stairs to the front door. You know, I use grounding blocks, mm-hmm. but you could use a stair step, mm-hmm. right? Grounding is um, what some people call like a pause up right. behavior. So it's putting the pause And that helps that kind of downward flushing Mm -hmm. movement. Um, And so you you could have the dog ground um, down each step. You know, have a grounding mat, have a block, have the dog ground on the raised stair step. Um, I, you know, I think you have to take it like step by step yeah 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 really scale back our expectations but then when we finally um got the dog to move fairly freely down the stairs um i we actually used a pram a dog pram for nonviolent, that's what I call nonviolent social processing. So the dog, and this had a ramp, he walked into the pram, that's how they went out of the door. So he could do social processing when he felt safe. And I have videos, he would poke his hat up outside the pram and look around and see who was there. And then when he was done with that, or maybe he didn't feel safe anymore, he would put his head down into the pram, which was a safe space for him. And then they would wheel him to the park. And then off leash, 
he um he had a lot more flexible room mm -hmm. right he was on a long line he had a lot more escape routes so he did much better with that space right. than on a city sidewalk in downtown manhattan absolutely um, and i that really worked and then over time, I mean, I think he's always a dog who's going to struggle with fear and mm -hmm. anxiety. But this at least gave him, and this was thinking outside the box, right? Mm -hmm. We were not doing clicker training. We were not pressuring him with food. We were recognizing his need for deep safety and trying to meet it in some pretty unconventional ways. I love it. I love it. Well, it's, it's like you were saying right at the beginning of it's, it's taking the dog in front of you and instead of applying a, a kind of box standard mm -hmm. um, template to how we engage with, with the dog, actually being in conversation in collaboration with yes. the dog. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And in reality, yeah. isn't that what we want for ourselves? I mean, I, I think <laughs> I'm constantly reminded of Kevin Behan's book about your, your dog is your mirror. And, and I think that that is, that phrase is just so true on every level that not only are there, there quote unquote issues reflecting what's going on with us, but also the way that we are expecting them to be in the world is a reflection of the expectations that are, are put on us. And what are we allowed to do and be in this world? And so they, they offer us the opportunity if we choose to take it to actually stop and question, is, is that right for me? Is that right for my dog? And do something differently. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I think you've um, hit on a huge area. Uh, and that is this uh, rhetoric of well-behaved, mm -hmm. right? Which applies to human children mm -hmm. and and dogs. And I have a whole thing in my upcoming transforming puppies course yes. that I'm doing with Annie Phoenix on, um, you know, the well behaved, the essence of the well behaved child is children should be seen and not heard, which is behavior suppression and also communication suppression no demands don't talk to me i don't want to hear what your needs are because then i might have to change what i'm doing god forbid right yeah yeah <laughs> well and let's face it i i i'm not a person who likes to change what i mean that that's been a struggle for me but i do it mm -hmm. right because that's what being a good partner mm -hmm is all about and it's no different with dogs dogs like children should be seen and not heard mm -hmm. that is the main message of puppy classes everywhere mm. who are you know teach puppies stillness and silence mm -hmm. no Absolutely. vocalizing no move me no moving sit down stay you know, non-moving behaviors right. known as obedience. Right. Um, that is not what puppies should be doing. Right. So what hey, is your... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go no, ahead. I was just going to say partly because that left brain, mm -hmm. the thinking cognitive part of a puppy's brain is so still undeveloped right right that asking them to um you know really call on all those inhibitory neurons that do not yet exist right <laughs> it's crazy I mean, how does that make sense right no right anyway sorry what were no you no i appreciate that no, I was going to ask you, so then with, with the course that you're running with Annie Phoenix on transforming puppies, which launches in January, but it will be the, it's, it includes videos so you can yeah. access it when you, you want it. And I'll include the links to everything that Laura's mentioned for the course, for the eBooks, the webinars, 
all of her wonderful stuff in the show <laughs> notes below. So you'll be able to access that. But I wanted to ask you a little bit. I love the the title of it, Transforming Puppies. I think that's a really empowering um, term, but I'd like to hear a little bit more then. So what are you going to be doing in the course? What can people take away from it? Well, I think both of us are going to do really different things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so we're both going to have a recorded presentation. Mm -hmm. And I know that Annie is going to focus on two foster puppies mm -hmm. that she um, took in from a local rescue um, that were ha had very difficult circumstances mm -hmm. let's just put it that way and she was um really able to turn them around they were scared they were traumatized they were um starving oh my gosh when yeah. she got them but by the end of a week they were showing a lot of confident behavior they were running they were showing emotions um so she's going to talk about what she did and some of that is what she appropriated from my somatic self-resilience course that she took um because that works much better in puppies than the traditional focus on obedience mm -hmm. in puppy class or really bad puppy play, mm. you know, where puppy play is just a free for all right. and puppies learn, whoa, I got to be worried right. here. Right. Um, I am going to do something a little different. I'm going to really focus on transforming puppy class ah brilliant um where i incorporate um the neurobiology of puppy learning mm -hmm. <laughs> because puppy class is usually 60 minutes of non-stop activity which is so counterproductive to puppy learning we wouldn't think of putting a small infant or a toddler in a 60 minute intense yeah. course. <laughs> Why do we yeah. think that's going to work for a dog? Yeah. yeah. So I start out with the need to really learn the neurobiology of learning and puppies and structure our classes accordingly. <laughs> um, and then I, I really do a lot on incorporating nonviolent social processing for puppies which includes social problem solving mm -hmm. for puppies rather than an, a focus on suppressing behavior with obedience like mm -hmm. puppies learning sit down stay not that i think those are bad behaviors but they are not the most important ones right for puppies we want them to learn the life skills the life habits that are going to set them up for being able to navigate just about anything they encounter, even if they don't understand it, never seen it before. Um, and I'm going to talk about puppy free work mm. as an essential part of puppy class. I'm going to talk about my ethic of nonviolent social processing and puppies oh, so i think it'll be uh really e even the even the you know a lot of books have come out on puppies especially recently mm -hmm. and i think they they're still in some ways holding to that um kind of normalized models of puppies and that kind yeah. of thing i mean yeah. and puppies are difficult they can be the biting mouthing episode i get calls on that all the time um and the fact that puppies have no inhibitory neurons 
Mm-hmm. That 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 is the last thing to develop in adolescence, like months later. So we've got to find ways to str- help puppies experience structure in positive ways not just by suppressing their behavior. Right. Oh my God. I wish you had had this course out when Lucky was a puppy. <laughs> I <tell you. laughs> well, I honestly think it's great for dogs too, but you know, yeah. we're focusing on puppies because if you start and I'm, I know you are completely endorse this. If you start when they're really, really young, you do set them up yeah. for success. Yeah. In the rest of their lives. Well, and don't you think that that's our job as pet parents? That yeah. we are meant to set our dogs up for success? Yeah. But what that means has been wildly divergent. That is very true. Very true. <laughs> uh, and so along with the label reactivity. Right. Uh, and the notion of nuisance behaviors um you know i i really want to get rid of this whole rhetoric of being well behaved i love it i love it laura i could talk to you all day honestly we'll have to have you back this is amazing <laughs> so helpful so i helpful. love to come back yeah oh, wonderful and and i i i will give you that title of webinar queen uh, you are, <laughs> you are amazing <laughs> truly amazing and and i can tr- i can advocate for they are not my experience of your especially your grounding webinar is not just a flippant little light you know 10 minute kind of thing they are in depth they are incredibly helpful i if you're interested i would highly highly recommend signing up for them so like i said i'll include links in the show notes if you're interested to, Great. to find out more thank you yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I want to ask you a final question Yeah, um, that I ask all of my guests. And that is how have dogs taught you about what it means to be human? Oh my God. <laughs> and this comes at the end. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've touched on a lot of things that could be applied to it, but I, but I love to hear when we reflect upon again in that sense of the mirroring yeah what what are our experiences with our dogs actually showing us about ourselves well uh to to answer that you know really truly and profoundly it would be they've taught me everything mm. uh because i come out of an experience of childhood post-traumatic stress syndrome uh, stemming from the age of four when I was four years old and animals horses and dogs not so much dogs then but horses because I was a real horse crazy person child um were my main experience of physical and kind of deep love and affection right and so uh then more as an adult when i began um i got my my first dog of my own in my own household uh not long after i graduated from college and um i do think because those dogs had behavior issues and i was working with trauma in them and client dogs it has been dogs who allowed me to revisit my own trauma which had been completely rec- misrecognized my whole life it was diagnosed as everything but trauma right so i had years of therapy like a lot of people i've had years of therapy uh which helped sorta it helped but um no 
human therapist put it together for me, like my work with traumatized dogs. And then I recognized I had a real aha moment. Yes, this is me. Back at age four. Um, and putting all the pieces together, learning so much about human trauma studies, going through that myself, using a lot of those, and then adapting them for dogs. I mean, it's really enabled me for the first time. And I'm not going to say how old I am, but uh, in in decades, decades to really feel like, okay, I understand what, who I was, why I did what I did. You know, no, I wasn't just being a, one of those children who were untrainable, unlovable, just being difficult. You know, all the things they get diagnosed as being um and no one is recognizing that it's coming it's an adaptive survival strategy for a much deeper emotional learning absolutely absolutely that's beautiful that's beautiful i can relate to a lot of what you've just talked about absolutely and that's been my experience with lucky 100%. i think a lot of people can mm -hmm. if we allow ourselves <laughs> And if we allow ourselves to talk about it, and I think that's yeah. one of the important things that I'm trying to do with the podcast as well is, is create a safe space to talk about this because mm -hmm. the more we shove it down, it's like you were saying, I mean, the, the body holds everything. It comes mm -hmm. out at some point. And it's the same with what we've seen with aversive behavior, aversive um, training approaches with dogs. You might suppress that behavior in that moment, but it stacks up and aggression will come out. Mm -hmm. again, at another point, because it has to, we can't yeah. hold it forever. Yeah. And so if we can take the perspective and create spaces for people to talk about this for ourselves and our dogs, we have a much better chance of actually doing something about it. That's meaningful. That's really meaningful mm -hmm. and, and really life enhancing for both of us. Yes. Absolutely. Is there anything else that you'd like to say to our audience before we go? Other than thanks for listening and love having had this conversation with you. No, I think that about says it all. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Laura Donald's friend, for coming on Mystic Dog Mama. We're so grateful to have you here. You're welcome. Thank you so much for joining me in this conversation with Dr. Laura Donaldson. Have you struggled with reactivity or aggression with your own dog? What was your biggest takeaway from this episode? Come on over to Instagram at Mystic Dog Mama and let me know. I'd really love to hear about your experience. If you are enjoying this podcast, I would be so grateful if you could like, subscribe, rate it, and leave a review. All of these things are so important for helping other Mystic Dog Mamas find the podcast and get the support they are looking for to best nourish their dogs and themselves, mind, body, and soul. And as always, let me know what topics you'd like me to cover in upcoming episodes or questions you have around nourishing your dog or yourself. This really is a community space, so if there's something you want to bring up for a discussion, I'm all ears. Again, just reach out to me on Instagram at Mystic Dog Mama. All right, that's it for now. I'll see you next time.